Marion Brooks, Vice President and U.S. Country Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Novartis, where we are committed to reimagining medicine for all people. It is critically important for us all to really address the historical disparities in healthcare if we want to have true health equity. One of the things that Novartis is doing to show our commitment to health equity is our Beacon of Hope initiative, where we have partnered with 26 historically black colleges and medical schools to establish centers of excellence to address diversity in clinical trials, climate change, and removing racial bias from the tests and standards that are used in the medical field. It's a $33 million 10-year commitment that we've made, but we go beyond just the centers of excellence at the four medical schools. We are also providing scholarships, internships, as well as mentorship to the students at the HBCUs over these next 10 years. This is just one of the big initiatives that we have here at Novartis, where we are doing our part to address this challenge that we all see and we're all facing. There are many more opportunities that we are looking at here at Novartis, and you'll hear more about what we're doing in the space of cardiovascular health later in the summer. I want to thank the CBCF for holding this important summit. And I want to thank all of you for being here and for attending, because the only way we get through this is together. And when we bring all of our minds together, the private as well as the public sector, that is how true change will happen. Thank you again for the opportunity to open up the summit, and I wish you all a great day. And welcome back to our Policy for the People Health Equity Virtual Summit. If you missed this morning's session, it was a dynamic discussion on Black maternal health, the risk factors of Black maternal health, and what we all can do as a community to address health equity on a global scale. But please do not worry if you missed it. We will have it on demand for your viewing pleasure on cbcfinc.org in the upcoming weeks. So please be sure to sign up for our emails and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube to make sure you stay connected to what's happening at CBCF. I also like to share with you that we are hosting our 29th annual Mervyn L. Stephanie Tubbs Jones Memorial Scholarship Classic on June 26th through the 27th at the Hyatt Regency in the Chesapeake Bay Golf Resort and Spa and Marina. Join us for this annual event to help give deserving students across the nation a chance to become impactful leaders. You can also register for that event at cbcfinc.org. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what's with all, the, all of those announcements? How does all of that fit into CBCF and who you are? Well, I'd like to take a few moments to tell you just about who we are. We are an organization that works to empower the Black community, and we do this through the work focused on education and equity and empowerment, like we're doing today. We were established in 1976 by 13 members of the 92nd United States Congress as a public policy, education, and research institute. 
and it was committed to improving the socioeconomic circumstances of African Americans and underserved communities. So we do that through many different ways. We develop leaders, we inform the global community on policy, and we educate the public by bringing together subject matter experts like we're doing today, industry leaders, elected officials, students, and concerned citizens so that we can all collectively engage in meaningful dialogue that will ensure positive change and help advance the global Black community. We also are focused on developing leaders for the future through our Leadership Institute. Each semester, we recruit, train, and provide opportunities for college students and recent graduates worldwide who come to Washington to work on Capitol Hill, in federal agencies, and in well-respected corporations throughout the country. At CBCF, we believe that no matter where you come from, what your background, socioeconomic or otherwise, you should have the ability to come to Washington, participate in an internship, and learn to serve without being deprived of that opportunity. It is essential that we think about our leaders for the future and how we are preparing them to help move us into the next century. We have to train these individuals and give them opportunities. That's what our Leadership Institute does. You should also know that we are engaged in research. Our National Racial Equity Initiative and Center for Policy Analysis and Research recently published four timely new research publications that I wanna make sure to share with you that you should know you can download at our website, which is again, cbcfinc.org. These topics cover some very critically important issues. One, the black dollar, part one, cooperative economics in Africa, reproductive rights, Dobbs versus Jackson and implications for the black maternal health crisis, the unintended consequences of algorithmic bias and reparations more than 150 years later the case of restorative justice policy in Evanston, Illinois. And finally, they just recently did a report entitled Appeal for Administrative Action, Canceling Student Loan Debt for Historically Black College and University Alumni. So we have a wealth of information for you. And again, we encourage you and implore you to get engaged, get involved and access these educational tools. We'd also like to make sure that we thank our sponsors for today's event. We cannot express the gratitude we have at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the support that these amazing sponsors have given us for today's event. Your contributions continue to help us advance the, the global Black community and create a world where all communities have an equal voice in public policy and beyond. So without further ado, let's get to the program. I would first like to introduce you all to Representative Terry Sewell. Representative Sewell is a formidable and dynamic leader who proudly represents Alabama's seventh congressional district. She is one of the first women elected to Congress from Alabama in her own right and a proud product of Alabama's black belt. She is also, most importantly to us, the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board. So please help me give a warm welcome to the Honorable Congresswoman Terry Sewell. Good afternoon. If you're just joining us for our second session, my name is Congresswoman Terry Sewell, and I proudly serve as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. The topic of our second session focuses on the leading cause of deaths across the demographics in the United States and the number one killer for all Americans. As frightening as those statistics are, the risk of having a heart attack or stroke is even higher for African Americans. There are several reasons why heart disease can be more prevalent in the black community, including socioeconomic status, access to care, and disparities in health equity. The good news is that we can improve the odds of preventing and beating these, this disease by understanding the risk and taking steps to address them. Each medical expert here with us today will help us understand these conditions and how we can focus on prevention and intervention to combat these complex issues within the Black community. Many thanks to our speakers for contributing to this critical discussion and for supporting the mission of the CBCF. We value your engagement and look forward to your ongoing participation in our Policy for the People series and beyond. Now, I would like to introduce a colleague that has been passionately leading the charge to improve the health and well-being of vulnerable communities across this country. 
as the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and co-chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus on, on Black Women and Girls. Please help me by warmly welcoming Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our afternoon session. I am Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and I proudly represent the second congressional district of Illinois. I am so pleased to see so many people joining us virtually for this very important discussion. The American dream states you're free to create your own vision of prosperity and success, no matter where you come from. But for some, for so many Black Americans, this dream is harder to achieve due to racial inequities that impact certain communities, mental and physical health. Today, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, Dr. Michelle Albert, Dr. Abina Osewusu, and Dr. Jude Nagang will talk about chronic health conditions impacting Black communities today and steps that can be taken to reduce the risk. The most common chronic diseases found in Black communities include high blood pressure, heart disease, elevated cholesterol, diabetes, cancer, mental health, and most recently, COVID-19. While not all Black people fall into one of the high-risk categories for obesity, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, these conditions affect everyone. And tackling the root causes of these illnesses while empowering people to manage their own health <clears throat> will benefit Black communities and the overall global economy. The reasons chronic disease rates are higher among Black and Brown groups are varied and quite complex. Most people tend to view chronic disease rates among minorities as a product of unfortunate circumstances. But in truth, the root causes go much deeper than that. Systemic, historical, political, and social concerns have set the stage for certain communities to live in impoverished areas, not to have equal access to education, health care, or equal employment. Many Americans have told us that even if you're able to show up to the doctor, you don't know if your bill is going to be $1,000 or $10,000. And that creates an incentive for people not to do as much preventative care or come for checkups. It's time that we reframe the conversation. Instead of saying what's wrong with this population, we need to be asking what is wrong with our social structures and within our healthcare system that allows this to occur and persist in this way. And that is why I'm here today to help to get to the root cause and find the solution to advance the global black community. We may not solve everything in this one session today, but we will always have some key takeaways that each of us can bring back to our communities to start a global change. I am excited to hear more from today's panel. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Dr. Hooper is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She works closely with the director to oversee all aspects of the Institute and support the implementation of the science visioning recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and promote health equity. Dr. Hooper is also an internationally recognized translational behavioral scientist and licensed clinical psychologist. To date, she has published over 95 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, what a fantastic community leader. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Doctor? Thank you, Representative Kelly, for such an enthusiastic and generous introduction. I really appreciate it. I want to start by just thanking the organizers of this event and the summit, which is amazing, and the agenda is really just fantastic and so informative. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this important session. So this session is on the, the impact of heart disease on Black communities. And we have three really fantastic speakers, and I'll be moderating a discussion with our speakers. So let's introduce them. So our first is Dr. Michelle Albert, who is the Walter A. Haas Lucy Stern Endowed Chair in Cardiology and Professor in Medicine at the University of California at San Francisco. She's also Admissions Dean for UCSF Medical School and Director of the Center for the Study of Adversity and Cardiovascular Disease, or the Nurture Center. Dr. Albert's clinical expertise involves both taking care of the most critically ill heart disease patients and preventive cardiology at UCSF. 
As a physician scientist, epidemiologist, Dr. Albert is engaging in cutting edge research that innovatively seeks to incorporate biology with social determinants of health to transform cardiovascular disease science and healthcare of global populations. That is the biology of adversity. Her research has been featured on national and international media outlets such as the BBC, Canada Broadcasting Corporation, Time, CNN, Today Show, CBS, Associated Press, NPR, Washington Post. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Albert. Our next speaker is Jude Gang, who is Executive Director for Representation in Clinical Research at Amgen. He leads the RISE team, which is dedicated to improving proportional representation in clinical trials in alignment with Amgen's environmental and social governance imperatives, health equity narratives, and ethical research commitments. Jude has been with Amgen for over five years and has held leadership roles for the Amgen Black Employee Network. He specializes in clinical sciences and innovation with a focus on patient recruitment and retention and representative participation in clinical trials across multiple therapeutic areas. Jude is also a pharmacist by training with the PharmD from Roseman University of Health Sciences. Welcome, Jude. And our third uh, speaker is Dr. Ab um, Abina Ose Wusu, who is committed to improving the health of global communities as a clinician, advocate, and drug developer, reflective of her core principles of health, service, and global citizenry. With advanced training and board certifications in cardiovascular diseases, interventional cardiology, echocardiology, and nuclear cardiology, she's worked in a variety of clinical settings, including tertiary academic centers, community hospitals, and private practice. And her clinical and research interests include coronary interventions, um, assessments of hemodynamic invasement issues around heart failure, and also the evaluation and management of cardiovascular diseases in women and racial and ethnic minority persons. And today she continues this work as a director in medical affairs and clinical development working in you know, just groundbreaking therapies within the cardiovascular disease space. So I wanna welcome the, the panelists and we're looking forward to an engaging conversation around what we can do to advance the knowledge and importantly, the health of our community. And earlier today, during the first session of the Health Equity Summit, panelists discussed Black maternal health in the United States and abroad. So Dr. Albert, let's start with you. How do issues of heart disease in the Black community intersect with maternal health outcomes? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hopper. Um, so I think the first thing for our audience to be aware of is that you know heart disease is preventable, right? Um, and that um, while one in three Americans have heart disease, one in two um, African Americans have heart disease. So that's the first thing to know. Next thing to know is that uh, six in 10 of maternal deaths are preventable. And given that maternal deaths are disproportionately um, skewed towards African Americans and the American Indian population, this is of dire concern um, for heart doctors, and it should be for all of us, uh, because the health of a woman um, reflects the health of a community in general. So the how maternal health is tied to cardiovascular disease um, includes the following, that the risk factors um, for maternal death and disability are some of the same risk factors for cardiovascular death and disability, and they include high blood pressure. So having your blood pressure be less than 120, the top number and less than 80, the bottom number is important. Being overweight or obese or ensuring that you have weight wellness um, is really important. The other thing that's important is also knowing your family history and your history um, of uh, maternal health. So preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure um, developing in pregnancy um, is a very strong risk factor for maternal death and disability, but also for later cardiovascular or heart health and brain health. Uh, so these three risk factors, preeclampsia or hypertension in pregnancy, obesity or being overweight, high blood pressure, 
all risk factors for cardiovascular disease are intimately tied to the maternal uh, risk factors for death and disability um, during pregnancy, and actually, as a matter of fact, post-pregnancy, um, immediately post-pregnancy. Uh, so these are all things that uh, tie maternal health uh, to cardiovascular disease. There are two other points I wanna make. Um, when we think about women um, and maternal health, we often think about younger women. But in our society today, a lot of older women, and I should say um, uh, more mature women, are also um, becoming pregnant. And in order to become pregnant, many of those women um, are using fertility treatments. And fertility treatments um, are actually tied um, to ontoward outcomes um, related to heart and brain health later on as well. So it's really important uh, to have conversations with your doctor, um, your primary care doctor, or seek out the care of a cardiologist as well, or a heart doctor uh, like myself, uh, to talk about your heart health risks um, if you are also um, getting uh, fertility treatment. Thank you, Dr. Arbut. Those are really great um, points. I don't know that this is a topic that we hear much about in terms of that intersection. Dr. Osei Wusu, would you have anything to add in addition um, on this topic of that intersection with Black maternal health and heart disease? No, absolutely. And I think Dr. Albert brought up a, a great point. I am one of those mature mothers. You know, I, I had my child later in life. And we know that pregnancies fall into various categories. Some are planned and some are not planned. But if you have the opportunity to, to plan a pregnancy, I think it's very important, uh, particularly for Black women, to think about optimizing our health before we become pregnant. So that is at the level of our weight. Uh, if there are any issues with insulin resistance or being pre-diabetic, et cetera, blood pressure, that you are in the best healthy state that you can be before even conceiving, because that pretends you know, your prognosis during the period of, of being pregnant. And then of course, immediately after. And then this point that Dr. Albert brought up about, it's not just about when you are pregnant or the immediate months after, we are now understanding that when you develop eclampsia, when you develop insulin resistance during pregnancy, there are long-term effects that affect your future risk for cardiovascular disease when you become much older. So it is extremely important for us to be thinking longitudinally about our health and thinking about the long game for our health, right? Not just getting through the nine, 10 months of, of pregnancy, but being around for that child that you are nurturing, right? and that we are taking all the steps that we can from a preventive standpoint to optimize our health at every stage in our lives. And that includes before we're pregnant, while we're pregnant and after. Thank you, those are excellent points to add. And I really like what you said about thinking about health with a long game perspective, which is often something that as younger people, we don't always do is think about how things will affect us in the future. So thank you for, for those additions. We know that heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States in general. We also know that adverse social determinants of health increase the likelihood of Black Americans experiencing heart disease. Social determinants of health is one of those terms in public health that we hear increasingly over the past couple of years. So I'd like to help define what we mean when we, when we talk about social determinants of health and how they affect our communities. I'm going to start with Dr. Albert on this question because I know your work also has focused quite a bit on the social determinants of health. Absolutely. Uh, thanks again for the question. And you know, social determinants of health is is a term that people are using, um, almost overusing in, in in many respects at this juncture. Um, but simply, um, what it refers to are social, economic, and psychosocial factors that influence individual as well as population health um, status, as well as quality of life and, and, and well-being. And generally speaking, when we think about social determinants of health, we think about you know, five major categories. Uh, the first category is that of economic stability. And we've heard that mentioned in the beginning. You know, underemployment, unemployment, um, or parts of uh, economic stability. Um, food insecurity, housing insecurity also fall under that category. The next category we think about is access to quality education um, is another social determinant of health. Because as you might imagine, and people will say to me, you know, Michelle, um, what do you think 
could be a, a major upstream thing that can be done about addressing social determinants of health. And I always hone in on the education part um, in terms of access to quality education because it gives access to opportunity and gainful opportunity in employment. Um, healthcare quality and access is another uh, lever. Uh, so those are three categories. And then neighborhood and built environment um, would be another category. And then as well as community context um, would be uh, the last uh, category. As you heard mentioned, you know, I direct a center that I founded actually at the University of California at San Francisco called the Center for the Study of Adversity and Cardiovascular Disease. And the entire throughput of our center is to look at not only studying um, the impact of social determinants of health and its relationship to what happens in our bodies at a molecular level, but also how we can develop interventions that incorporate social determinants of health into strategies that improve cardiovascular and other forms of health. This is really important because we know when you think about a pyramid of health, that the bottom of that pyramid, um, which are the social factors, um, are the major factors that contribute to health outcomes ultimately. The things as you go up the pyramid that include um, education, prevention, um, yeah, care that you might get in, in a hospital, um, those are things that have less impact on our health outcomes over time. So again, social determinants of health, social, economic, and psychosocial factors um, that affect our health and well-being. Thank you for that. I mean, I think one of the things in the way the question is phrased is, is about the adverse social determinants of health, because I think, as you mentioned, it is a term that's probably used overused at this point. And it's sometimes likened with health disparities, which are very distinct. And social determinants of health don't have to be negative. There are positive things in environments that, that make our health better. And then there are the adverse social determinants. And that's, that's I think, an, also an important distinction to make in this, in this space. Um, Might I add another point here in the space, um, just because it's in the middle of my mind about the adverse um, events, is that when we think about social determinants and we think about things like adversity, psychological stress, chronic stress, of which things like racism, neighborhood environment and structure are core components of adversity. However, um, you know, some stress is actually important for us to be able to exist and thrive. When we talk about stress and adversity, what we're talking about is actually toxic stress and adversity, which is what results in um, problems with um, brain function, problems that result ultimately in heart health problems. Thank you for that addition. It's like the weathering hypothesis is what it yeah. reminds me of is very, very similar. And, uh, the risks involved with that exposure to chronic stress. Would anyone else on the panel like to add anything on this topic of social determinants and how it affects our communities, adverse social determinants? I mean, Dr. Alba hit it out of the park, but I think that the point is we're learning a lot about the social determinants of health and how impactful they are in terms of health outcomes, right? So it's no longer just the typical risk factors that we were taught about in medical school. You have to take this into account and it must be part of your management of, you know, patient at the individual level, but also populations, right? When we're thinking sort of, you know, about this new approach to, to taking care of people, not just looking at one person at a time, but looking at the entire group and how we can make impactful and large changes that this must be integrated into the solution. Absolutely. And we want to hear more about solutions. Let me ask another question, and I'm going to uh, turn to Gang for this question. How do, can you talk about the work that you are doing in terms of seeking to eliminate disparities in the quality of care? And can you also share with us any current initiatives and collaborations that you are undertaking to help address heart health disparities in the Black community? Thank you, Dr. Hooper. And, uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you to the CBC for, for inviting us and for hosting such a very important topic. And I think before I even go into that, maybe I can take a step back to thank uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, Congresswoman Terry Seward, and also Congresswoman uh, 
uh, uh, Joyce, for, for the efforts that they've been doing and their leadership in advancing sort of the, 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 the efforts to address this, this issue at the, at the legislative level. Now, while they're doing what they're doing, I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity to share also what we are doing at this end to do what we can. So I think uh, the, the, the issue has really been highlighted by, by both Dr. Albert and Dr. Owe Esu. Now what I can focus on from, from our perspective at, at Amgen is looking at it from a three-pronged approach, which it's been mentioned already by the, the first two speakers, which is the, the education and, and, and awareness. And then, and then secondly, that access to, to quality healthcare. And, and then thirdly, from a public health standpoint, which also includes, again, the, the social determinants, or for in our case here, I'll talk specifically about the economic aspect, which Dr. Albert uh, talked about in terms of the things that we're trying to do. So from a, from a education aspect, we're really an awareness, we're, we're collaborating. We recognize we cannot do it all. We need a partnership, we need collaboration. And, and we're partnering with already existing organizations that are also invested in addressing this issue, like the Association of Black Cardiologists, the American Heart Association, where we, uh, an example I can call out is the partnership uh, to, to, to advance uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, the, the, we, we, in collaboration with the ABC, where we're bringing sort of, uh, sort of the, the various players within the healthcare ecosystem, uh, specifically the payers, to, to really highlight what are the the, 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 restrict, the negative impact of the restrictive formulary health plans, how that impacts access to innovative therapies that, that address uh, some of the issues like, like uh, high level cholesterol, which, which uh, we, if these patients have equitable access to these treatments could help reduce the, the disparities. And then uh, to go again in another example uh, that I can call out from, from, from a sort of a collaboration at the grassroots level as well, to say, how do we uh, in, in empower patients uh, in collaborating with, with the American Heart Association uh, for a three-year program that we're working on now to empower patients to, to really take charge of their health as well. So doing it from both education from a provider standpoint and also from the patient standpoint. And now uh, a key important aspect about the, the, the public health, uh, the, the economic one, uh, because uh, Dr. Dr. Albert really called it, if we don't address that, it's really hard. It's not only about medicine. We recognize that at Amgen, and we have a, a very, a very a, a health equity imperative, which was published a, a couple of weeks ago. Our 2021 report, which really highlighted our efforts in this space. And then I will talk about the specific economic aspect. We've already broke ground on 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 on, on some facilities within uh, Ohio, the state of Ohio, and also North Carolina, uh, creating about 750 uh, family sustaining jobs through our commitment our pledges uh, via the 110 program, which is for having uh, 1 million jobs for within 10 years for specifically black Americans uh, without even a college degree. So starting with these uh, sort of initiatives where we creating these economic opportunities, we think as Dr. Albert really called out, you handle those upstream aspects that can address potentially uh, food insecurity and also housing insecurity. So that combining these efforts, we think that we can also help reduce the, the disparities in, in health outcomes, in addition to the innovative therapies that were, were, were given access to the patients. Thank you. Such a, a long list of, a comprehensive list of activities and initiatives that you're involved in. And we certainly want to see the outcomes of that and hope that they are as positive as as you anticipate they will be. It's, it's a lot of work. It's very complex, this work. Um, Dr. Osea Wusu, I'd like to ask you the same question in terms of, can you share with us any of the work that you're doing to sort of seek the elimination of disparities in the quality of care and any initiatives or collaborations that you're undertaking um, in the Black community? Absolutely. And so I think what Dr. Nagang mentioned is really the power of collaboration and recognizing that we, even in the pharmaceutical industry, we are part of a larger healthcare ecosystem, a larger healthcare community. And it's very important for us to partner and collaborate and do so effectively if we really want to meaningfully impact the lives of the patients whom we're seeking to have you know, better lives, right? It's no longer just about medications. I think we have 
gotten past the stage of awareness. We know we have much more to do. So part of that, again, is par uh, partnering with you know, large professional societies, again, like the American Heart Association. Novartis is also very proud um, to be the sponsor of a very large initiative in the space of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, right? So this is the form of cardiovascular disease that is the biggest killer within the United States of America. And a large part of this program, which looks at how we can, uh, within systems, large healthcare systems, how we can optimize the care of the patient who has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but it follows them beyond just that system and a single interaction, but also seeks to address these social determinants of health, right? So we are partnering and collaborating effectively with a professional society to start doing some of this work. Another initiative that I'd like to call attention to, and they're, they're numerous, we don't have time to cover them all, but another great one I think is the Philadelphia Collaborative for Health Equity. And this is a really special one because this is very community focused. And I think it's really important that we start recognizing that we don't just tap into communities when we want to recruit for clinical trials, right? We start engaging with communities at the earliest point, because you need that um, trust building, you need the education, and you really need to raise awareness of any particular disease state. In this case, speaking about stroke, it's focused in North Philly, a very high risk zip code, and it's partnering with healthcare systems in, a, in the Philadelphia area so that we can once again address the social determinants of health, but then positively impact those cardiovascular risk factors that are leading to disproportionate outcomes related to stroke in the Black community. So how we approach health equity and how we can partner within this large healthcare system, I think Novartis is taking great steps in a very short period of time to do that. And you, of course, heard about the Beacon of Hope project um, that uh, Marian Books spoke about at the beginning of the session, which is really about helping us to build a pipeline, right? That we don't do this work in isolation, that we develop a pipeline of scientists, clinical research centers of excellence, and researchers who can continue the work um, that needs to be done. So this is very multifaceted. It requires all hands on deck, and we are so happy to partner with all of those them that, that we're doing so with. All hands on deck. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Dr. Albert, I'd like to add, pose my next question for you, and it's about COVID-19. You know, over the course of the pandemic, we know that COVID-19 had this has continuing to have a disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic minoritized communities. Can you talk to us about the impact of COVID on cardiovascular health? I, I, I will, um, but I want to make two comments in follow-up to um, our previous speakers. Uh, I think that it's really, so both of them mentioned uh, the Association of Black Cardiologists, um, as well as the American Heart Association. I think it's important for our audience here to know um, that, you know, who may not even know what the Association of Black Cardiologists is. Uh, Association of Black Cardiologists has been in existence for 50 years, um, and it is the only cardiovascular health organization um, that was founded to actually um, focus on the cardiovascular health of um, Black Americans um, or Blacks globally and, and, and has expanded to focus on diverse populations and has been championing this for 50 years. Um, and, and so I think for our audience, if you are looking for an African-American cardiologist, um, feel free to go to the website for ABC to look for um, um, connections. Um, and then for American Heart Association, I think the American Heart Association is, is very, very much involved um, in the partnerships that you heard um, mentioned and, and has a huge platform um, to be able to amplify um, the work um, in communities. Uh, now, the question was about COVID-19. Um, so COVID, you know, despite COVID, um, in the last several years, heart disease, it's important to remember, still remains the number one killer, followed by cancer and then COVID. Um, life expectancy for Blacks has dropped about two years. Um, and this is from being the having the group with the lowest life expectancy to start with um, because of COVID. Now that we've moved into um, an arena where um, there are less deaths from COVID, um, my concern is that there is beginning to be an increase in complacency around um, the infection in that, okay, it's just a mild thing. I, I may not even have a fever. I may be okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that what we're seeing in the cardiovascular arena is that we're seeing that there's a 
something percent odd, 65% increase in cardiovascular um, events a year out from COVID. This includes heart attacks. This includes strokes. Um, it includes having electrical problems with your heart that can cause sudden cardiac death. Um, so just even having mild COVID infection um, is ushering in the second wave of what I say is a tsunami of cardiovascular disease. And this is in our population that is disproportionately affected, um, again, from cardiovascular disease up front, and then you get it on the back end as well. Um, so what we're seeing in the hospitals is that we're you know, seeing patients also show up with uh, inflammatory conditions. Um, it might be um, exacerbating um, underlying things like conditions they have like lupus um, that could be then contributing as well to heart dysfunction. Um, and as I mentioned, we're seeing heart higher levels of heart attack, stroke. Um, there's the brain fog from long COVID where um, folks are reporting not being able to multitask, not being able to concentrate. These are all vascular, by the way, um, and cardiovascular. Um, and there's uh, increased dizziness and lightheadedness and passing out um, that we're also having to take care of. I was just on an inpatient service last week, um, and we've been uh, seeing more and more of these uh, things show up related to cardiovascular. Interesting. Thank you for all that really valuable um, data-driven information. To so get vaccinated. <laughs> yes. Get yeah. vaccinated. Absolutely. And boosted. <laughs> and boosted, yeah. And boosted. Let's talk a bit, you know, you um, talk about underlying conditions. We talk about risk factors. I, you know, and some of the risk factors for heart disease are controllable and some of the risk factors are not controllable. So I'd like to talk about the, you know, risk factors that are that impact a patient's risk of heart disease. First, I want to talk about the the kind of comorbidities or the underlying conditions that seem to have particular um, adverse impact. So that would be uh, individuals with high blood pressure, hypertension, who are in that category that we call clinically obese. Um, Dr. Ose um, Wusu, can you talk about? We know that you know over fifty five percent of Black adults have high blood pressure, and almost 50% are in that clinically obese category. So how do these conditions, as well as diabetes, impact a patient's risk of heart disease? Yeah, first, I think I'd like to make a, a clarifying comment that high blood pressure, hypertension is cardiovascular disease, right? So if you have high blood pressure, you already have cardiovascular disease, and we frequently refer to it as a silent killer um, but this is a very dangerous problem to have. Your body is full of blood vessels, you know, and you're, you have arteries everywhere, but there are two organs that are very sensitive to excursions and blood pressure. That's your kidneys and your brain. So when you have this even mildly uncontrolled blood pressure, your kidneys see that over time, your brain sees that over time, and frankly, your heart is also seeing it over time. So one of the first things that's frequently affected by blood pressure being abnormal is the heart itself. That can predispose you to abnormal heart rhythms and frankly, heart failure, which is quite rampant within our community. So just hypertension in itself, I wanna make very clear, it is not benign. And it is extremely important that we get a handle on the appropriate control of blood pressure and that you know, you gotta go below 120 over 80. When you go and see someone and your pressure is 130 over 90 and they're like, that's good. You say, no, no, I heard, you know, when I was on that CBC F uh, talk that it should be under 120 over 80. That's what you can do to help yourself, right? And of course, trying to have a healthy lifestyle. But yes, there are traditional risk factors in addition to the social determinants of health that we've already talked about, like, um, obesity, which promotes insulin resistance and generally creates an abnormal uh, metabolic environment within your body. So then you're also more prone to have abnormal lipids as well. And we know that having a elevated LDL cholesterol, what we used to call the bad cholesterol, is the, the most readily modifiable risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So when you add all of these things up, a little bit of insulin resistance, not even full-blown diabetes, some obesity, a little pressure. What you're doing over time is really creating a milieu within your body for the development of significant vascular disease. And it will not only affect your heart, but it will affect all of those critical arteries that feed your kidneys 
and that eventually can lead us to develop problems and require dialysis feed your brain leads to more strokes and, and issues related to to brain health and then even your peripheral arteries right we don't spend a lot of time talking about peripheral arterial disease but you know those people who have difficulty walking and frankly we have a significant disparity when it comes to amputation when we develop peripheral arterial disease we don't get managed like other populations we get our legs cut off so it's really important to do what we can to prevent diseases from happening in the first place, but to also improve our education and awareness so that we know how we should be treated, right? So because that, that's still a challenge that we face when we seek health care. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, wow, this is the time is going so quickly, and I see that we could talk for, for a really long time. So I want to ask a few more questions, if we can, before the session concludes. And I'd like to ask um, if Dr. Albert has anything to add in terms of uh, addressing lifestyle factors. You know, what can patients do to monitor their health? And when you think about a high risk lifestyle, what what does that really mean and what can we do about it? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think where I want to go with the answer to this question is to, you know, sort of fill in some uh, things and also tell patients or tell the audience, you know, steps that one should uh, take. Uh, so the first thing is, is that, you know, our, the prevalence of uh, sickle cell disease in our population is um, highest, right? Um, and we have a lot of folks who are sickle cell, uh, who, who are carriers of the sickle cell trait. What, what that does is that sickle cell trait, trait actually underestimates um, the prevalence or the, the diagnosis of uh, diabetes in the population because of how um, the, uh, because of the glucose levels um, in our body. So if you are somebody who has sickle cell trait or you're told that you have sickle cell trait and all kids who are born in the US, um, everyone who's born now is, is screened for sickle cell um, and you don't have the diagnosis of diabetes, um, you know, just watch out, right? Because the measures like hemoglobin A1C that measures glucose over time um, is uh, under, underestimates uh, that diagnosis. So um, just really, you know, sort of hone into that. The other point I want to make about the risk factors and I want to talk about the lifestyle is that, you know, when we think of cardiovascular disease, oftentimes we think of it as some a disease of the older, uh, middle-aged or older person. But in fact, you know, you heard that hypertension is the most potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and is actually cardiovascular disease. And we know that 15% of children have hypertension. And we also know that blacks get heart attacks and strokes at a younger age, right? So this is something that's happening in, 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 in as early as, you know, a kid um, and certainly in adults in the 48-year aged group. Um, so I want people to do the following things for their lifestyle. Um, the first thing is you need to know your numbers. Uh, you need to get your blood pressure under control as you already heard and you heard those numbers. You need to get your know the numbers for your cholesterol levels. You need to know what your weight is and whether it's a healthy weight or not. Um, you need to get adequate sleep, which means at least six to seven hours of sleep per night. You need to help control your stress levels. And, and some of the most immediate ways you do that is by having digital detox, you know, not hanging on on Twitter and social media and your computer screens all the time. Selecting to do, if scripture is something that, that re-nourishes you, use scripture. If it's mindfulness, do mindfulness. Um, prayer meditation. Um, making sure that you are physically active. And by being physically active, it could just mean, you know, walking uh, 30 to 45 minutes per day, five days a week. I tell my patients to start slow. So start 20 to 30 minutes of walking. If you're in a neighborhood or environment where you feel that it's not safe, um, getting connected to YMCA or a gym and developing a buddy system um, where you can do so. In terms of the food that you eat, eating a more a Mediterranean type diet. And for many people are like, what is that? Um, so the simple way I, I, I think about that when I tell my patients is if you have a plate of food, make sure half of that plate is filled with colorful fruits and vegetables. And then another quarter to, uh, another quarter of it is filled with protein dense uh, meats or fish, okay? 
Um, and that's a nice, easy way, you know, to, to start with that and to contextualize it. I also tell my patients uh, and uh, at, at meetings and, and, and so forth and in, in, in sessions such as this to make sure that you engage with your healthcare providers and get healthcare providers that allow you to feel comfortable uh, mm -hmm. where you can speak up um, and voice your concerns um, and write your questions down before you go to your doctor. Um, so that when you get into the doctor's office, we all get anxiety. You know, I'm a doctor. I get anxiety when I go to my doctor. You know, so writing the questions down before you go. And then very importantly, two other things, knowing the signs and symptoms of strokes and heart attacks. Um, there's a something called a BFAST acronym um, for stroke. Um, and there's also knowing that, you know, it can be chest pain, shoulder pain, back pain. It can be stomach discomfort educating yourself about the signs and symptoms. And if you're experiencing them, call 911. We have to love ourselves and love our communities. We also have to be advocates for ourselves um, when we go into the doctor's office um, as a part of self-love uh, for I don't know if that answered your question. I, I yeah, went no, that did, that did answer the question. Thank you. Let me ask just one more question, I think, depending. And I want this to go to gang because, you know, along what, what we're just talking about with Dr. Albert, we have to get the care we need. We know many people um, in our community don't seek health care right away. It's sort of a last resort, right, to go to the hospital. And, and part of that is the widespread and very reasonable and well-justified distrust of health care and clinical research. Um, and, you know, we hear more about studies, especially recently Tuskegee syphilis study or the Henrietta Lake cell, cell line. Um, have you encountered any of this in your work with trying to engage uh, persons in clinical trials? And what guidance would you offer that part of the community in just a couple of minutes? Thank you, Dr. Hooper. First, to acknowledge that myself, when I first learned about the Tuskegee, I was alarmed and also lost trust. But uh, uh, as a pharmacist, uh, when I was a student pharmacist, actually, I did uh, identify or observe that well, some of my patients were not really responding, uh, of African descent were not responding similar to the other patients. And, and when I looked further into the information that proved that these drugs do work, I did not actually see uh, people that look like me represented in the, in the evidence uh, that proved that the drugs work. So that was, it became a personal mission for me then and, and continued on while I moved back, uh, thankfully, to, to industry. And, and, and the team that I lead at Amgen, uh, the representation and research team, we're doing a lot of work on this and to ensure that uh, we develop medicines going forward to include people that uh, from the Black community as well, so that we, we are intended to benefit from this treatment. But our work now account, accounts for that lack of trust and that's, that distrust, where we're now working in partnership, very important partnership and collaboration with with uh, 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 clinicians like Dr. Albert as well, and and also trying to revise the way we do design these trials, uh, working with the patients, the community leaders, uh, community leaders, advocacy groups as well to help us in that process to ensure that the patients are included, to know that we are doing this in an appropriate way. Now, uh, addressing the issue of trust, my message to the community, my community is that we've come a long way from Tuskegee. There have been measures in place now, not only the FDA, we also have independent review boards or ethics boards, that even if the FDA says we go ahead with the, with the clinical trial, the review boards can still stop us and say no. So these checks and balances are in there. Now, uh, with the new way that we're doing with collaboration, we want everyone to be part of this process because with cardiovascular disease, we are developing the next generation of therapies to address the unmet need. And our call to action is really that we need more dialogue about this, also empower, as Dr. Albert said, have the conversation with your doctors about clinical trials. Let's start the conversation and move it forward so that we are included in the next generation of, of medicine. Thank you. Awesome. What an awesome panel. I mean, I have the pleasure of closing this out. Let me just add one more suggestion because we've talked about a lot in this session about the issues 
about the risk factors, about solutions, about what we can do as individuals and to help with our family, our friends. We want to bring this information back to the community. I know that these wonderful panelists who are super impressive, you are all really amazing, I hope we can stay in touch, um, are just doing amazing work and are here because we care about our community and we want our community to be heart healthy. I want to add one more thing to the, the suggestions on how to be heart healthy and reduce our risk, and that would be to quit smoking. Um, I'm a former tobacco cessation researcher, and it's a huge risk factor, um, one that we can control. And so I'd like to also encourage that we add that to the list of things that we should do. So I want to thank all of you very, very much for participating in this session. I think it's been extremely informative. It's been high energy, and we didn't even have enough time to get to everything we wanted to ask about today. Um, and again, I think that you know, you are amazing representation for the community and you demonstrate why it's import important that we have people who are part of our community working on these issues. I'd like to turn it over now for closing remarks to Nicole Austin Hillary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Incredible panel, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Thank you again for leading such an impactful discussion. And I agree with you. We could have spent many, many more hours with this discussion um, because it, these are such critically important issues, but you all did a fantastic job. Um, I'm absolutely inspired and empowered by the experiences that each of our community leaders have shared with us this afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this insightful discussion, highlighting outstanding health resources in maternal care and how we can work together to advance the, the global black community and health equity and how we can learn to take better care of our heart health. Thank congressional members who have been with us today, our CBC chairwoman, uh, Joyce Beatty, who could not be with us in person today, but who is with us in spirit. We thank her for all of her leadership we thank CBCF Chairwoman, Congresswoman Sewell, Congresswoman Kelly, we thank you for your leadership and being here with us today. And we thank Congresswoman Underwood for always supporting the foundation and for each of you being leaders who make the decisions that help to change and empower our lives. We appreciate your participation today. And to our distinguished panel who embody true community leadership, thank you each again for an engaging and thoughtful discussion this afternoon. Finally, I would like to again thank our sponsors for supporting today's summit. Your dedication and commitment to this essential conversation are pivotal as we work together to spread awareness and to help empower the global Black community and give them the tools they need to take care of themselves, their families, and the world. Now, before you go, I have three requests of each of you. Number one, we want to hear from you please scan the QR code to complete a survey about today's event. Your insight and contributions help us meet your needs for future events. Make sure, number two, that you follow us on social media through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And it's an easy way to stay connected to the CBCF and to make sure you are always on top of the events and activities that we are hosting, again, for your benefit and for the benefit of the community. Number three, Spread the word and save the date for our next event, which will be the 2022 Scholarship Classic. Again, an amazing opportunity to network, spend time with our CBC members. It is a golf event, it's a fun event, but it's about a purposeful mission, which is to raise money for our students, our internships, to again, ensure that everyone has equi equitable opportunity to come to Washington and learn about policy and leadership. Today's summit has been nothing short of powerful. So again, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you at one of our next and upcoming CBCF events. Take good care.